Welcome back to the Home Inspection Whisperer podcast. Today, I have the boss with me, Mary Lamaster. If you do not know who she is, she is going to introduce herself a bit. Yes, my name is Mary, and I am the managing partner with A Action Home Inspection Group. And I also happen to be married to Chris. Oh, uh, that's that's a that's a plus, right? Yeah. <laughs> what? I think it's a plus on your end. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely, or at least A Actions, right? <laughs> No, no. All right, cool. So uh, we have several new announcements here. And uh, what we are going to cover today is we got an email from a fan and the fan had uh, several questions. And what I think is great about this, it's like someone that doesn't really know a whole lot about the industry. They kind of had some experience uh, from by proxy, you know, like one of their friends is in it and they're like, oh, I can do this. And so they don't, they're not in the industry. So they're writing an email asking a whole lot of questions about starting a business. So I was like, man, this is, this is really great content. And, uh, we're going to, uh, Mary is actually perfect because the person that wrote the email coming in to the business is a female too, as well. So, um, she is asking questions about starting a home inspection business. So we're going to cover that. That was a little all over the place, but it makes sense. <laughs> so a uh, few announcements. Uh, we are going to Ashy. Yes. Uh, and that's January what? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I know it's like the third week of January, I think. So it's like... Middle of January. Yeah, I will be there. Okay. And if you are going to Ashy, we would look forward to seeing you there. Uh, one thing to know, though, is they are enforcing masks and vax cards. Yeah. If you don't get vaccinated, you have to provide proof of a negative COVID test within 72 hours before the event. Okay. Okay. So it's not required a vaccination. No. It's just, uh, you have to either provide proof of a negative COVID test or vaccination card, which I need to remind myself to bring with us because it's not something I usually carry around. Yeah. And uh, the, the reason why that I really do believe that they're doing this is because two years ago, whenever we went, a whole bunch of people got sick and it was at the very beginning of COVID. And a lot of people believe they actually had COVID, but yeah. it wasn't a thing yet. So, I mean, I got sick from it too as well. So yes, it's kind of annoying, but at the same time, it's like, hey, let's be safe. We're about to be a bunch of people from all over the U.S. in one place. So yeah, it was very interesting timing because everyone came home from ashy sick, except for me, because some of us don't shake hands and sanitize at every opportunity and don't touch our face. And it shows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> facts. I mean, you didn't get sick at all. I did not get sick. <laughs> but a lot of people and actually were hospitalized with a respiratory virus that no one could identify. So it is like a very strange coincidence. And that was January of 2020. And then Mardi Gras is when the big outbreak happened in New Orleans. And we were in New Orleans for ASHI. So it's very, very possible. Yeah. ASHI was like patient zero for yeah, COVID in New Orleans. Possible. We're not <laughs> I'm safe. not saying Don't come at me, ASHI. But <laughs> it is a very, very well timed. Also, you want to mention Internachi is doing their Texas conference the three days before Ashy starts. Oh, yeah, they are doing that. And yeah. uh, several of our team members are going up there, too. And that's in Brian. Yes. Right? Brian. So um, Ashy raised their prices. And so we were going to bring our team members to Ashy, but we realized it was just not economical to fly everybody and get hotels and pay for food. Right. Uh, and pay for the Ashy tickets. So, um, just by coincidence. Is it coincidence? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Oh, by, uh, Internachi's Internachi going on. <laughs> is holding their Texas conference uh, three or four days before Ashy starts. So we're sending a bunch of guys up to Brian to do that. Yeah. And honestly, uh, both conferences are producing pretty good classes, I would say. Yeah. I mean, like Internachi has a really good, I mean, better than the conference better than all the other years i think their class lineup it looks good well, well this is the first year internachi's doing it prior okay. to that it was to priya which is the texas um inspector association right and internachi purchased or they merged or did something yeah and so internachi and to are the same thing now yeah um, so, so the class lineup looks good for both so you won't see me at the uh or us at the uh the, uh, Texas and Texas and Arachi one, but we were going to be at the Ashy one, but several, I think four, four of our team members. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Four, four of our team members are going up there. So that's yeah. good. That's cool. Um, one other thing, uh, we just finished teaching one of our SOP classes yes. too as well. So if you are in Texas, uh, keep an eye out. We do produce, uh, SOP, uh, legal and ethics classes. Uh, it was 
It was a little bumpy, but I made it through it. <laughs> yeah, we do them quarterly. So this yeah. was our last one for 2021. Yeah. Um, and then we'll start them up again in 2022. Uh, this was the new SOP, legal and ethics SOP class. So that explains the bumps because we, um, you know, track change or the Texas Real Estate Commission changed some things for the legal and SOP. Um, I think next time I'm going to rewrite my class a little bit. Yeah. yeah we're going to rewrite um, it. We're going to try to get, I'm going to go out there and try to get some field pictures and then we're going to yeah. try to put some of the SOP with like some actual field content videos, uh, together. So I think, uh, next go around, we have what, four months, five months to really, yeah, we have some time. Uh, um, I usually it. don't run them till the end of each quarter. Okay. I don't like to run them at the beginning of the quarter cause we're always so busy. Nice. Yeah. So we're going to revamp it. I mean, it was already revamped, but we're going to put in Re revamped. They're going to put in some more effort into it. So, uh, the next one is, uh, we built a new t-shirt line. Yes. So, on Shopify. Uh, yeah, on Shopify. So we have some really, uh, creative shirts. Let me, uh, lo look up, um, and we want to give a shout out to our marketing coordinator, ECs, who is responsible for all the designs. So when you see them and they are all awesome, uh, Chris and I came up with the logos and then we gave them to, or not the logos, the sayings, we gave them to ECs and she did some fantastic, uh, design work. Oh, I um, can. I, it says opening soon. I can't, can't see. Can't look at your I, own t-shirts. I can't look at them. Where are no. your le uh, where are your notes on that? It's uh, in the notes section. Click the notes. Oh, we yeah, we wrote them all down, didn't we? Yeah. Um, shirt ideas. All right, there so <laughs> there we go. So we also, you know, there's not very many home inspection t-shirts out there, and so we, we came up with the idea, like, well, let's just kind of create up our own brand to help support the podcast and the YouTube channel a bit. And the first one is just the basic one where it's just. Home inspector. So yeah. I love I love this. I'm buying a million colors of this because it is fantastic marketing. Yeah. One time I we got a job because I walked into a hair salon wearing my uniform and um I got a call from the receptionist at the hair salon like two weeks later that said, Hey, I saw you wearing a shirt that said you worked for a home inspection company. Can I schedule a home inspection? So yeah. I mean it's amazing. It's, it's just a, yeah, it's just a t shirt that says home inspector. And we yeah. have two different ones, like a big one and then a, a small lettering one. Yeah. So. And it opens up conversation. You yep. you never know who's looking for a home inspector. Exactly. Yeah. And then the next one is we have an, an emoji of like a house and it says it's like home destroyer. Mm -hmm. That was that was just kind of a yeah, fun one. Yeah, kinda see that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh then also, you know, I always like to say you don't get the dough unless you put on the show. And so if you're a fan of the show, it's gonna it's going to have a dough show because mm -hmm. that's what y'all turned it into. It, you don't want like to say it all. So dough show. And then you have a deal killer. Which is funny because EC's put in like, she used a font that makes it look like something from Scream or something. Yeah. Yeah. Deal killer. So if I ever interview real estate agents on my show, I'm going to wear, I'm going to wear the deal, the deal killer, killer shirt. Be amazed how many times I have to talk about deal killers. Yep. Yeah. Um, as built. And, um, then we have one that says grandfathered. So I, which thought, is cute. I thought that would be really good for, uh, any of y'all that are out there that are grandfathers and then it, it's a double meaning. Yeah. It's yeah. a double, it's very cute. <laughs> yep. Deficient. Uh, that's more of a Texas term. I think, uh, I don't think they use it too far, too much up North is like deficient, but uh, I, I think might. that's just a word in yeah. general. Yeah. I deficient. <laughs> Tool junkie. That's because we like to like to like those tools and we're going to start uh, reviewing tools. We got two tools from tool experts and I'm going to be reviewing those this week. Uh, and inspector should have caught that. That's actually kind of funny. And uh, let's see, let's go check it out. And Oh, did we do this one? Your house made me drink. Oh, I don't remember if we actually did. Did we do that one? I, I can't remember her seeing it up there. I'll we'll have, have to review today. We'll have to review at it. And then, uh, yeah, so your house made me... I don't remember seeing that uh, that one being up there. But uh, yeah, so that's our new t-shirt line. And if you're interested in purchasing a t-shirt, we make a very small fraction of the t-shirt. But I, I think the shops are going to be open. So let's when we're talking, it's November 8th. So it should be open by Monday next week. No, we'll be open tomorrow. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Like all they have to do is turn it on. Okay. Wow. That's it. Okay. So November, <laughs> November 9th. Yeah. So we'll be releasing the podcast and then you'll be able to, by the time you're actually probably watching it or listening to it, it'll be, it'll be live. All right. And uh, just would, in time for the holidays before we. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm. Great Christmas everybody gift. in your family a shirt that says home inspector. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then 
well, before I, we get into this email, I always like to talk about, you know, a complaint that we had. And this is actually kind of funny. One of our home inspectors, you know, he was using the infrared camera on the inside of the property. And the good thing is the buyer was present too at the time of the inspection. And so he was scanning and he kept getting this blue mark. So um, it was on a water stain, obviously. So to prove that the infrared camera is seeing the blue mark, he put the moisture meter on the ceiling and then the ceiling just fell apart like you got about he didn't it. and he didn't put any pressure he just touched the ceiling and it yeah. fell in and then like rodent feces fell out Ugh, and gross. pieces of insulation and uh so you know how that goes you know it was fine until the inspector touched it mm -hmm. and uh so the plan of action that we did took care of that is you all what we always like to say is you tell mom first so uh, but you don't want to do it right away. So Tyler, we let him finish the whole inspection, review it with the client, and then you always make those calls at the end of the inspection so it doesn't interrupt your timeline for the day. So we called the buyer's agent first, informed them that we're going to let the listing agent know what happened, told the listing agent, obviously sounded a little bit annoyed, informed the sellers, and we kind of thought it might have gone away. And then like three days later, they called in. They're like, oh, so inspectors just put holes in ceilings. And I just had to explain to her. The they situation. never start out nice. It's no. always, it's never <laughs> subtle. Yeah, it's never subtle. You're damaging my property. I'm like, no, ma'am. Uh, this was actually the daughter of the parents or something like that. And I was like, no, ma'am, that, that's not what we do. We, you know, we just, we touched the ceiling and it fell apart and rodent feces fell out at the same time. And what? if anyone touched it, it was going to fall apart. So it's actually good that it fell up, that, that it happened to us and not the buyer moving in because then they would have blamed, you know, us anyways. So, yeah. so it <laughs> so, failed under testing essentially. So, yep. It failed under testing and I explained it to her and then she was like, all right. And then kind of went about her way. But you know, it, it still is a win for us in our opinion. We might not win another client from the seller side, but the thing is, is, we it, represented it, our we, buyer. We represented the buyer in a really good manner. So just remember, just because something breaks and you're a home inspector out there doesn't mean it's 100% your fault. So I don't know. You have anything to say on that one? Nope. All Other right. than Tyler did a good job. Yeah, Tyler did a good job. You know, he didn't, you know, panic or anything. He was finished his job, went about, went about the whole process and, and we accomplished the mission. Yeah. So that's pretty much it on that. So uh, we are going to move on to the next part of the show, which is the email. And this is an interesting email. And any of y'all are experienced inspectors out there, do not judge. Because, you know, remember, this person doesn't know a whole lot about our industry. So we're, we're just pretty much coaching and talking them through it. Yeah. All right. And, and it's our opinion, too. Yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of opinions out there. So I'll let uh, Mary uh, break into it and we'll go from there. All right. So our email today comes from Natalie. She lives in New Jersey, which actually is a big thing um, when she's going to ask about litigation. So keep that in mind that she's from New Jersey because we'll be addressing that later. Anyway, Natalie is not a home inspector, but she would like to open a home inspection company. Um, she's looking at one of the franchises. I don't now. She didn't list the franchise. Even if we did, we wouldn't mention it. But you know what type of franchises we're talking about, like... Um, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. People yeah. know, right? Yeah. I don't have to list names. Yeah. Um, I can't even honestly on the spot can't even think of one right now. That's okay. What's the big one? I don't care. America expects. <laughs> it it is what it is. Yeah. It, I mean, we don't pay attention to any franchises because most of those franchises are iffy. But anyways, we'll go from there. Uh, anyway, she asked us a couple questions and um, we decided the best way to answer them would not be an email response form, but would be on this podcast. Exactly. So like Chris said, this is a no judgment zone. If you have any thoughts or comments uh, about uh, any of her questions, we're happy to um, yeah, throw see in them the, in the comments. Yeah, throw in the comment section. We'll talk about it. Just easily. be nice. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Because I know, uh, Natalie, as you will find out, sometimes home inspectors are not very nice to each other. Yeah, facts. <laughs> um, all right. So question one, process to finding a home inspector. Actually, look at her business vision first. Oh, Let's do I'm that. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Her business vision. Aim to do, and this is a direct quote, aim to do at least 100 inspections, if not more, in my first year. Recruit an inspector a month before I start with the franchise, approximately end of March 2022. To start, I would handle the marketing, phone calls, inspector schedules, etc. If I'm lucky and have a lot of jobs and I need to jump in as an inspector, 
I will look into ACC. But for now, thinking I can handle it if I'm able to work with one inspector in the first year. I just realized she wrote, if I need to jump in as an inspector. Yeah, yeah. There's no licensing in New Jersey, is there? I, I honestly don't know. But so this is, uh, so, you know, we're just trying to interpret the business and vision as much as possible. But one of the things that I break into this and what I'm understanding is you want to hire an inspector, right? And hire someone with no business whatsoever, no business set up and hire them to work for you with no equity in the business. So that being said, you know, you, you have to think about your business plan and your business partnership there. It's like, how do you find someone that wants to work for you when you have no true work to produce? So I just looked it up. To become a home inspector in New Jersey, you must have a high school diploma or equivalent, serve as a licensed associate inspector for one year, perform at least 250 inspections, carry $500,000 in insurance, and pass the National Home Inspector Examination. Okay, so they're licensed up there too. They are licensed. Yep. So starting this business and you want to start it from ground up and you do not want to be in the field right away and you want to have someone work for you right away. The biggest thing is I'm going to say is you're going to need a partner, a business partner. If you want to run the office side, you that's 50% you, and then you're going to need someone on the field side, and that's going to be 50% them. Starting it from ground up and finding someone to work for you with the experience that you're asking for to be competent in the field, is I, f I feel like it's going to be impossible. It is a lot to ask First of all, that he's addressing her first question, which says process to finding a home inspector, ideally a seasoned home inspector with at least one year of experience. It will be a true challenge to convince somebody to join in with you unrelated to you. Without you an know. established business. Yeah, without an established business. Um, I wouldn't do it personally. The only reason I own a home inspection company is because I married a home inspector. Um which I, I hate to like make it sound that easy, but <laughs> not saying you yeah. have to marry somebody, but you would need to find someone who's willing to be a business partner with you, not an employee, because you will be very hard pressed to find a home inspector who's just going to be like, yeah, I'll work with you, lady who has no prior business experience and barely has a company. And, you know, I don't know you. Right. You no. know, it's it's that's a lot to ask somebody in any field, not no, just yeah. home inspections. I 100% agree with that. Even if you are purchasing a franchise and it has like the name of a franchise, yeah, you're purchasing the business, but just because you have this franchise does not mean work is going to come in. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't mean people want to work for you either. So, so going back to what Mary was talking about, I said, if I have to jump into the business, I might hire ACC, which we've talked about in the past. Um, what I would recommend doing is if you're already thinking about becoming a home inspector before you do any of this, become a home inspector. Yeah. Get in the field, learn the ins and outs of the infield stuff, and then develop a business and then work your way out to or work your way to hire that first inspector within the first year. I just think it's I think it's going to be really close to impossible to buy a franchise and then turn around and find someone to work for this franchise with no trust, trust yeah, or guaranteed work with no equity in the business. Yeah. So you have two options, find a business partner or um, become that home inspector right away. So that's how we started our business, really. Chris was the home inspector. Yep. And so... I was grinding every day. <laughs> yeah. So interview and hiring process. So this is second question. Yeah, second question. Since she says, since I'm buying a franchise, they provide training for anyone I bring on board. So I think I'm all set there. Okay. So we're not going to worry about training, but let's talk about interviewing and hiring. Um, we have a multi-step process. Would you like to go over it? No, go for it. Yeah. Uh, first we review their resume and then I do the phone interviews. And the reason I do the phone interviews is because, oh, and this is once one of those posing as a bigger company. I usually introduce myself as office manager. Mm -hmm. I don't introduce myself as the owner because I want to see how people react to an office manager. You can tell a lot about someone who they are as a human being, how they react to an office True, manager to staff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
Uh, if they're dismissive of me, if they're rude, or if they act like they want to be interviewed by somebody bigger, then they're immediately struck down. So that's really the first test is I don't identify myself as the owner, although the ruse might be out now. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I tend not to identify myself as the owner uh, just because I want to see how people react to me asking them questions. If they pass the phone interview, then we do an in-person and um, at the in-person, we give more detail about the company. We really make it clear what our company stands for, the values we're looking for, and you know what you're expected to do, et cetera. Uh, and then if they pass the in-person interview, they do a ride-along. And that is for our lead inspector to see, to kind of get another feel for them. We pretty much want to make sure that they're going to work better, great with everyone in the company, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and then the, the lead will be there the first inspection and then the, I'll show up on the second inspection for the day. Yeah. They'll do two inspections in one day. Um, and then after that, we, you know, I, I think pretty much everyone who's done the ride along has actually gotten hired. Yeah. They have to do the final interview too. Yeah. Um, but usually that's just, um, yeah, formal, but you Form, never know yeah, what yeah, if they don't show just, up. <laughs> it, yeah. Well, we've actually had a lot of people not show up to the ride along. Yeah, I don't know happen. if you remember that in the early it days. Was like three people. Yeah. yeah. In the early days, um, when we only had two inspectors, like when we were in the process of hiring our third, it took a long time because people wouldn't show up for the ride along. I, I know. Yeah. They was, would do the in, <laughs> they would do the phone interview and the in person and then just ghost us. So uh, that was bonkers. That really doesn't happen much anymore, but it, it happened enough. Yep. So um, anyway, yeah, that's our interviewing and hiring process. And basically in the interview, you want to be direct as possible with your expectations, because if you're not, that's going to come back to bite you in the butt. Yeah. And one thing I do have to recommend in the interview process, and I still remember this today, is like whenever you're starting your business and you're really, you know, wanting it to grow, well, you need people, right? And you think everyone is good, but no, everyone's not good. And I still really didn't even learn my final lesson until even this year. Right? It's because he doesn't listen to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But my this year, you know, honestly, if you get a bad feeling or a bad vibe during the interview, just stop and just move on to the next person. You will find the right people to be in your company that want to be in your company too as well. They want yeah. to be part of the team. So uh, and that one bad person can interrupt the flow of your business and your working environment for your whole team. So, you know, you you really got to be careful who you choose to join your company. And there have been a few times where we're well into the training process and we'll have employees just call us and be like, you know what? I'm getting weird vibes from this person. I'm not comfortable with them. They they don't seem interested or they just don't want to do it correctly or they're rude yeah. to the client and, and then they're gone done. this is done yeah yeah i mean our team members so, are invaluable to us yeah so don't ever think yeah and that, that's a great point too so like even though that you're invested say a few thousand dollars in just paying it's better uh, to lose the money then yes, than later because <laughs> it'll, it'll just get worse it'll it, just get worse and you'll end up losing more and more money so just take the loss and just let it go uh from there yeah so What's the next question? I think we hit that one pretty good. Yeah. So once I find an inspector, do I bring them on as W-2 or 1099? Um, so that's going to be up to your state. You know, you really want to look into your state uh, because there's some states that will, if you, it depends on how you hire your inspector. So in like, I know in California, if like you're supplying all the uniforms, the jobs, they can't work for anyone else, uh, the, they have to be a W-2. Uh, and you have to pay them a certain way. So really that is going to have to be your state question, but we can tell you how we do it. Yeah. So let's talk about on the federal level, because in the state of Texas, you can pretty much do whatever you want. That is both good and bad. All right. I will say that. <laughs> I'll say that up front. Because if you do a 1099, you're relying on someone to file their own taxes correctly. And I have news for you folks. If they don't file their taxes correctly, the IRS is going to come after them and then they're going to come after you. That's the risk of the 1099. How do I know that's going to happen? Because I know people that that have happened to multiple times. Yes. Because what happens is you need to report your, their income and they need to report their income and you're reporting it on two separate levels. The IRS, no matter how big or small your company is, they match those 1099s. Right. And if you have someone who's not claiming all their money or just not claiming at all, 
the IRS is going to come after everybody involved. Yeah, so we, if you can, I'd recommend doing a W-2. And a lot of people actually like W-2s. Yes, uh, if, because they don't have to do their taxes. Yeah, especially if they join the company. You know, it's just part of that part of joining a, a company is that it's something that they don't have to worry about. Sorry yes. about that. And yeah. so t- W-2s guarantee that they'll pay Social Security, um, you know, basically all their FICA taxes. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, it will does, it does cost you more money. I'll admit it does cost you more money as the employer, but it covers your butt and their butt during tax season. And honestly, when it comes to the tax man, I'd rather be more safe than sorry. As Chris knows. Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, we do pay them a W2 commission style. Yes. So at whatever jobs they do, they get a commission on and it's ran through a W2. And that's one thing I want to bring up. It's like some States that's not legal. I was going to say, yeah. you need to check on your state because the state of California does not let you do commission on a W2. Yeah, but Texas, you can. Yes. Cause again, we can do anything yeah. to our right. detriment sometimes. All uh, right. So next, if, uh, this is a sub question. If I bring them on as W-2, since I would only have one employee, do I need to offer health insurance, 401k, or other benefits? Um, so federally, you don't have to offer health insurance until you're over 50 people. Look at your state law and state of Texas, we don't have to health ins- offer health insurance at all. Mm-hmm. But uh, federally, it's over 50 people. But uh, in New Jersey, definitely check your state first. Right. Um, we do not offer health insurance because it makes no sense. I could not get any health insurance plan on this marketplace that I would feel comfortable offering people. That and also it, it wouldn't save them any money. No, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like the deductible would be $10,000 and, and and that's stupid. And what the company would have contributed and what they would have contributed if they got their own uh, plan, our company wouldn't have to contribute anything and it would still be the same price. Yeah. So it was like, no, it's easier for them just to get their own health insurance. We do offer supplemental insurance through Aflac, which um, most, it's a couple different things, ambulance, cancer, dental, vision, most importantly, long-term disability and short-term disability. And one of our team members just used it because uh, his back got injured or something. and Outside it, of the home inspection. Outside, outside of home inspections. He didn't, it wasn't like a because workman's short, comp thing. Yeah, but. short term covers um, your personal time. Workman's comp covers your work time. Right, yeah. And uh, so he, he covered, what, like six or seven weeks yeah. of pay? Yeah. yeah so that's, that's really cool. Yeah. The 401k, we didn't start offering till we had four or five employees. And that, yeah, that's pretty tough because it does get expensive, but, and so... Uh, but it also creates a healthier work environment too, it, because it does. you, you know, these people are their, their, your team, they're, they're working for their retirement too, as well. They're not just working for that paycheck. So yes. they know that there's a future after being a home inspector. So I would recommend trying to get it as quick as possible, but I wouldn't say you have to have it on ground one, but I would say as soon as you hit three inspectors, you would still, that's when you would start to really look at trying to figure out how you can implement it in your business. And that would be the next step of growth uh, for your company. So I want to say two things. First, with that 401k, it's a benefit to you as well, because you can save for your own retirement, which is a huge deal. Yep. Um, also, I, I mentioned Aflac. Not all states allow Aflac either. So do check into that. Um, the other thing about the 401k is a lot of employees, or at least in my experience, find the benefit of the 401k more um, helpful than the benefit of health insurance. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The because K, yeah. honestly, health insurance in this company and this country, and this is not even a political statement. This is a fact is so messed up, at least with the 401k, they know that they're going to get something out of it. <laughs> that's a fact. I mean, yeah. that's what it comes down to. Yeah. yeah that money's theirs. That money is theirs. And, um, all Quest- right. Question two Yep. of that sub it's a sub question again. Do, do you recommend I reimburse them for gas and meals? No. Unless yeah. they're 1099. They can write that off themselves. Yes. But uh, no, that's kind of worked in the way that we pay our employees is we pay a higher commission rate. Mm-hmm. So overall, they make more money, which they can pay for their own gas and meals. So that really breaks down the way you want to pay them. If you want to pay them hourly, that might be something that you'd be like, okay, well, I would have to reimburse them for gas or mileage and figure out a way to track it. But So we do our pay structure to where they make more money uh, 
I think they actually make more money even if we were going to reimburse them for gas. And so mileage. the IRS, uh, this might change with the new administration, but the IRS no longer allows people to write it write off. off their gas or depreciation, if which, they're W-2s, but which if is they're ten, garbage. But if they're 1099, yeah. they can. If you're 1099, um, in fact, some states require you to reimburse for travel. I used to work in the District of Columbia and I had to be reimbursed as a 1099 employee for travel on the metro and stuff like that. So you need to check your state's requirements. Remember, everything's different depending on how you pay them. I would not recommend any reimbursement for a W-2, but for a 1099, you might be required to. Yep. And yeah. the next one, the final question is, which we already kind of touched on this, how much should I pay them, hourly, commission, or per job? Well, it's the final sub question. There's more questions yes, after this yeah, question. Yes, final sub question. Yeah, yeah, and I, I recommend commission. This is a, a really, there are people out there that do hourly, but I, I really do believe that this is a commission-based job. Everybody and, makes money. Yeah, and, and it kind of makes everyone kind of a part owner of the company. So whenever they go out there, they do a good job. They know that that's going to generate more jobs, which will eventually increase their paychecks. You know, uh, I, I, I just... I don't I don't know of a company out there that's hourly where the comp the employees are as happy as our employees, <laughs> you know, or team. I don't like to even people call them. like people like commission. They hear yeah. the word commission and they see dollar signs. Um, but I, I can tell you as someone who worked for it, every type of job, salary, hourly commission, commission is always preferable. You f yeah. you make more money in the end. Yeah, because, you know, say they're making thirty dollars an hour and they do two Four hundred dollar jobs are going to be like okay, but what if they do two thousand dollar jobs and still only making thirty dollars an hour? Then they start to think they're like, man, am I really part of this company or am I just a, a worker bee? Yes, you will make a lot more money hourly. One hundred percent, as the owner, you will make a lot more money if you're paying your team hourly. If you're bringing in the workflow, that is. Yeah. But I, I definitely would recommend to try to to look at it as a commission based if you're trying to build a community and a team. Yeah. And that's what Mary and I believe in is the we I guarantee you do not make as much money as other multi inspector firms, but we run it as a community and a team and everyone is essentially a part owner of the company. I wouldn't say part owner, but everyone has, um, they know that they contribute to the company. Yeah, yeah they also that get we it. wouldn't have a company without each individual person doing their job. Yeah, and that's part of the commission. And then they also, we also do a prop, uh, a profit share. So, uh, we do that I, quarterly. I hate that word too. It's more like a bonus, a bonus and excess. I don't want to call it profit share because that makes it sound like there's it basically it's just extra money. Yeah. But C courtesy of profit first, which helps you allocate that extra money, which is a conversation for a, a yeah, it's a, a different, different podcast, day. but it's a, it's our accounting style. And we follow this uh, accounting style called profit first, and we can hit that one on a, a future podcast. But Natalie, uh, if you're listening, um, I would recommend you read the book profit first, cause that will help you lay out your accounting for your company. And that actually hits one of your questions here too. I oh, think. Does it? But yeah. Oh, yeah. number five. So let's that. do number four. Let's do number four. This one, uh, I'm going to laugh at. Not at Natalie, but what I'm going to respond is making going to make me laugh. What do you use to keep organized and track the schedules for the inspections, or does a regular Google Calendar suffice? Do you want to say this? So actually, uh, this can work either way because I do know companies out there they use Google Calendar and they work perfectly okay. But as soon as you start to grow your company, you can do it by yourself and do you know, or run a team of two and use Google cal calendars and be locked on. But as soon as you start to do a lot of home inspections, you're going to need to move to ISN or a a, a CRM. A scheduling there's software. other softwares out there. We use inspection support soft uh, network, but there's softwares with uh, with a CRM built into it. So you don't just have to use inspection support network. Um, That's the thing. ISN is, you know, it is the biggest company. Is it my favorite company? No comment. Do I have to, do I feel like I have to use it because I can't find anything better? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, do you know how often, how many times a week I'm screaming about the ISM? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there's, there's some bumps in there, but it, you know, it, it works. And it, it works. And so it what, does what it needs to do. So what, what the inspection support network does is it sends out all the emails. It uh, keeps track of all the, all your reports, your data, your payments, and your payments, and it runs payment processing so uh, through a third party, but it you it, can run payroll through you can it. Roll payroll through it, so it keeps all everything together. So that's what I was saying. It's like you could use 
Google Calendar if, if you're trying to keep your expenses low, but I would move into a CRM as fast as possible. And if you, you always want to think of yourself not as a small company, you know, whenever you're building a company, think of yourself as a million dollar company and look at how I always like to say how McDonald's runs, for example, you think that you think McDonald's would be McDonald's without a, C, a proper CA, CRM or a program running, helping run their company? No. So you really have to always think big and not try to save money where you can. So I'd jump into a CRM as fast as possible to keep yourself organized. All right. Number five is, do you recommend any specific legal and accounting services for small business? Um, profit first. That's a big one. Just read that book. Uh, and then QuickBooks for your accounting. You can actually run payroll through QuickBooks too. I would recommend it because it's easy to integrate all of those services. We used to have a service for payroll and QuickBooks and um, it's too many services, basically. It's easy just to integrate it. You can also do timesheets through QuickBooks. You can do leave through QuickBooks. You can pretty much do everything now. Um, Legal, you remember I said, keep in mind that she lives in New Jersey. You live in New Jersey, which is the high, most highly litigious state in the United States. Yeah, I think you learned that at ASHI two years ago, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. The tri-state area, which is Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey are the highest litigious areas. And most inspectors actually hold licenses for those three states, just like most lawyers actually hold licenses for those three states. Um in the state of New Jersey, you have to hold $500,000 of liability. I would recommend a million. Um, essentially, as I had a lawyer from New Jersey tell me at ASHI uh, in 2019, yeah. maybe 18. Maybe, ah, it was 2018. Wow. Um, that you will get sued if you live in New Jersey. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how many people decide to do it. And you know, with that, with that being said too, I know there's a service up there uh, that that will, he'll be there at Ash. I can't re- think of his name right now. But, I can see his face. Yeah, but he's it, there every year. But it, he has a service, and I believe it's like fifty bucks a month. And as soon as a demand letter comes in, all you do is just send it to send it to him, and then anything after that is. Uh, covered. It, that's it's just fifty dollars a month, and that's what he does. Is he just protects lawyers? So you mean inspectors? And, and, yeah, inspect. Yeah, yeah, Sometimes pro- lawyers need lawyers. <laughs> yeah, uh, he protects inspectors, and I think that's a really great service. Like you don't even have to write your, uh, you know, you don't have to even do the responses. You're like, hey, I got this. Here you go, and then he just takes over from there. And he, uh, I think it's like a $50 a month fee. And And I think that's because in New Jersey, your liability insurance doesn't provide you with a lawyer. In the state of Texas, our insurance, our E&O and liability and professional all provide us with a lawyer. So again, it it is different state by state. You need to look, if I recall, the reason he does that is because in New Jersey, you're actually responsible for hiring your own lawyer. Yeah, The insurance will cover it, but you have to hire your own lawyer. Yeah, I think that's a a really... Great service, though. I, I need to look up his name, but maybe even try to get him on the show because that would be awesome now that I'm talking about it. I should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, um, next. This number is an six, easy one. do you recommend I get a second cell phone number? Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> yeah. I think that's where a common misconception is, too, is like what happens is, is like you people just think, hey, I'm starting a small business. I'm going to use my own phone and then get a second phone later. Well, what happens whenever you get that second phone? You know, you have do you just make that your personal phone now because you made your first one a business one? Yeah, so automatically just get another cell phone or, or a voice over IP. Yeah, you can uh, have an app on your phone where you can have multiple numbers come into that phone. Yeah, I just get it on, go on Google and get a voice over IP and then just start using that. It's, it's pretty cheap. It's like $50 or something like that. And then a monthly fee or, and uh, you can have multiple phone numbers come in through the app, but it rings normal. Uh, it's, it's it's super easy to get another number. You don't even need another cell phone. It's just voice over IP it. And then whenever you do get a call center or even another phone, you can just direct that voice over IP to the the main line too yeah. as well. So voice over IP it is. So number seven, any words of advice for a woman entering this field and what else you think is crucial to keep in mind when starting this business? So um, it's actually a difficult question. First thing, if you recall, I said that home inspectors can be mean. That's very true. 
Um, I'm not calling any percent. I'm not calling anyone out, honestly, but I have met a lot of, but any field I've been in, people have been mean. So that's going to be any field. The problem with home inspections is it tends to be an older generation. They're slowly going away. I think it's changed a lot over the past five years. Yeah. I mean, dramatically. Since I got in the business, it has changed a lot. It used to be a lot of, are you the secretary? Um, you know, do you just answer the phones? It used to be a lot of that, but that has changed. I think, um, husband wife teams where the woman is an equal business partner has definitely become more common. Mm -hmm. Um, prior, you know, like Chris said, five years ago, it was a lot different. Like the husband was always the boss kind of thing, you know, even though he's in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you just to expect your garden run of the mill sexism. I hate to be that flippant about it, but we're women, right? We sexism comes with any territory we're in. Um, I think the biggest thing is, make sure you're hiring people who understand you're the boss. And that's something we've encountered as business owners. There have been people who work for us who don't understand that Chris and I are equal bosses yeah. and those people don't work for us anymore. Yeah. The, and uh, also I, I do believe it has changed. So it's not going to be as hard as you think it is. There's a lot of uh, women out there that are really good home inspectors and yeah. I follow them on social media. And I think they're, fantastic at what they do and uh they're really good at marketing you can see that they really uh do a good job for their clients and uh they're i've looked at their reports too just because uh you know just just poking around and the reports are solid as well so you know i i wouldn't stress too much the fact that uh, that you're a woman entering this business i'd say five years or six years ago i think it would be a little bit harder but what I would do is just make sure that you really know your stuff if you are in the field, because I do believe you could be judged harder yeah. uh, than a man. I yeah. mean, like, I, because they're automatically going to get out. And it's the same kind of judgment that I had whenever I first started the field. It's like when I first got in the field, I was, you know, what, 23, 24. And I looked like I was 18 years old. So yeah. as soon as someone got out of the truck, they automatically like, oh, this kid doesn't know anything. And you probably could face the same judgment. So just make sure that you hold yourself well. You make sure that your knowledge is uh, spot on. You make sure that you have really good training and your routine is down and uh, you'll be able to create a, and you create a really good product and boom, you will start flipping people and getting clients in there. So just make sure that you know your stuff. And I think that's the biggest thing whenever you're getting into the home inspection industry is if you know, that's because we had one inspector that he's very he's older and he's a man and they get out and be like oh he's been doing this for years and then they didn't judge him at all you know but he's actually only been doing it for like a year like (laughs) i said your garden variety run-of-the-mill sexism yeah yeah so the you you're gonna face the same judgment i did whenever i was first in the field and i the the way i i conquered it is by just being locked on yeah i I bet as Chris points out, there is a disparity. If you were an old white man, you'd be fine. Um, young white men, women in general, and anybody who is a minority, we do have to work that just that much harder to make people take us seriously, which is unfortunate. It's and which fu- is why I call it garden variety it's, sexism. It's fine. I mean, just understand your challenges and what you got to conquer. It's not really that big of a deal. Just, just make sure that you're locked on and you're good. Um, But as I mentioned, as a boss, make sure they understand that you are the boss and no one is allowed to refer to me as Chris's wife. (laughs) You're funny. Yeah. All right. (laughs) All right. Cool. So I really hope uh, that answered all your questions. That covers the full email. Um, And then also uh, remember that we do have those shirts up there. So if you can uh, support the show by hitting the subscribe button, buying the shirts and hitting that little bell on the YouTube channel. And so you can catch us on the next show and subscribe on the podcast on the apps and whatnot. Uh, yeah. Do you have anything you want to say before you exit? No, nope. Thanks for having me on. Let right. me know if you have any other questions. All right, cool. And then uh, as I review uh, this podcast, I'll make sure I write it down. So we cover those topics that I brought up in the past. All right. Thanks guys. And uh, catch us on the next one. Bye.